it was already mentioned that the, the, the context to Paul's letter to the Corinthians is he wrote to a church that knew about having sports events. And uh, obviously they thought the Isthmian Games were much better than this Olympic game nonsense. They thought they were gonna they were gonna last. Clearly the other guys uh, won out in history. Um, they had these games every two years, and uh, they knew all about what it takes to really stretch yourself to participate in something that is beyond normal human capacity. Um, as an example. The other day, a guy named, I can't know how to pronounce his name, I think it's Eliud Kipchoge, a Kenyan guy, won the Berlin Marathon. He ran it in two hours, one minute, and 39. Now, Katerina, my record for the half marathon is slower than this guy for the full marathon. <laughs> so just it puts it into perspective. Hands up, anybody who's been training this year for a competition or an event, come, let's see it. I see two hands. Shocky. Three. Go on, four, right. Okay, so there's a lot of there's a lot of lessons to be learned yet. <laughs> apparently, um, Paul knew about what it need, what it takes to to set yourself out, to stretch yourself further than just being um, just cruising along, and he uses this image of training for a special sport event to teach us about well, what does it take. To, to stretch ourselves beyond just mediocre, beyond just our comfort zone. Unfortunately, human nature is that we are very comfortable with our comfort zone. That's why they call it the comfort zone. And it takes a very deliberate choice to push yourself beyond that. Because we know, we know the answers. When we don't, we don't sit still in our comfort zone. Our, our comfort zone actually sags down and down and down. Our comfort zone... Um, confines us to a far lower level, to far less than what it used to be. So by nature, anything that is alive needs to breathe and to grow. And our spirituality to be alive needs to breathe and to grow and be confronted with the tests that, is, that are required that proves it is alive. Because if there are no tests, if it's never uncomfortable, you'll never know that you're alive. And similarly with our spirituality. Let's go back to the text and read together. Um, we're going to spend some time in this chapter, so it will be good if you open your Bibles to 1 Corinthians from, from chapter 9, from verse 24. Paul says, Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one gets the prize? Run in such a way as to get the prize. Everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. They do it to get a crown that will not last, but we do it to get a crown that will last forever. Um, the image here is <coughs> about an individualistic sport. Athletes run for themselves. Unless they're in a um, relay race, then obviously that's a, a team event. And there's a lot of comparisons between team sports, like let's take uh, rugby, or individual sports. As Christians, in a sense, we are in both a team and an individual sport, aren't we? Because as a team, we are able to encourage one another. We're able to see when someone is struggling, when someone is running in the wrong direction. Uh, we can teach each other some of the techniques. You know, what do you do for your training? What have you been doing in the last couple of weeks that works for you? What doesn't work for you? Um, are you feeling spiritually ill? There's a lot of comparisons we can draw. But just as Christianity is a team sport, it is, to some extent, also individualistic sport, like athletics. Because I can encourage you, or you can encourage me as much as you like, but in the end, I have to make a choice. I have to choose to keep on running. Um, I have to choose to make the difficult... I have to make the difficult choices sometimes that is not comfortable, it's out of my comfort zone, that is not easy... Sometimes it is difficult to gain the benefit that I need to be a top athlete, individual athlete. And so as individuals and as a group, we have a role to play in this, let's call it sport or training of Christian training, our, our daily Christian training. Um, <clears throat> going back to the text, it says, 
They do it to get a crown that will not last, but we do it to get a crown that will last forever. Many of you will know that in those days, when they finished the race, they didn't get gold medals. They, they were um, given an olive crown that was twined from, from olive twigs. But the symbolic value of that olive crown was much, because everybody knew you only were given that if you were the winner. And look at the comparison that Paul draws here between all this effort that one can do for the glory that comes from winning an event such as this, but that the prize by nature is always temporary, never going to last. But spiritual, a spiritual reward is always eternal. And by comparison, think of the relative value of that spiritual reward compared to any, any human endeavor that you can run after. Some people run after becoming rich, but that is always temporary. Some people run after pleasure, entertainment. I want the easy life with lots of uh, options and comfort, but it's always temporary. At some point, you get old and you die, and all of those temporary things are gone. There's only one thing that is really eternal. That's the, the spiritual reward that God promises us when we run the spiritual race with all the other athletes in the room. <clears throat> Next verse, <clears throat> verse 26. Paul says, Therefore, I do not run like a man running aimlessly. I do not fight like a man beating the air. The image I get here is that we can all go to the athlete, we can all go to the track, athletics track, we can all put on our athletics clothes, and already then you look the part, you can all run a couple of rounds around the block, but it can all be fake. It can just be a show. And you've got to ask yourself, what is the point of just putting on a show? Because it's not about fooling everybody else in the room, it's about that relationship we have with God. And if we spend a lot of time trying to fool other people that we are playing the part, we're really wasting our time, aren't we? You do, you're going through the same motions. You are here on a Sunday. You, um, you may be quite busy, actually. You know, I may be quite busy with something. Like, let's say, they ask us to go help at Visanta Kral, and you rock up and you go. But if, it's not, if there's not a relationship behind it, with God that is driving this, you've got to ask yourself, am I wasting my time? And that is what a runner that is running aimlessly is doing. He is running, he is getting tired, but he's going nowhere. A boxer beating the air, I could find he's probably getting tired enough, but he's not hitting the target. And that's the image that Paul is creating here. Since we are already making, since God calls us to make the effort. Let us make it with the right aim and the, in the right direction, knowing that why we are running in the first place, and to me that's always the relationship with God, that drives the, re the reason to run, and that when we box like a boxer, that we hit the mark, that we don't go chasing um, side roads. Sometimes when we are confused, I mean, we don't always know the truth, that we investigate and say, okay, fine, this is what the text says, and come back to what God wants us to do. Then the next verse, he says, No, I beat my body and make it my slave, so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified for the prize. This to me is probably the, the big, the, the, one of the two big wake-up verses for today. The other one is going to come, 10 verse 5. Think about Paul and his circumstances. He is probably one of the most famous preachers in the Bible. He is somebody that we all would agree was a spiritual man and who lived close to God. And he had enough self-insight. Um, and he had enough honesty to look in the mirror and say, <clears throat> after I have preached to others that I myself will not be disqualified for the prize. Consider that. This is Paul saying this. Now, if Paul can say, there is a possibility that I can teach all of you the right things, but I myself miss the prize, how much more should we look into the same mirror and ask ourselves the same thing? In this room today, we have Sunday school teachers. 
who spend a lot of effort teaching kids, we can ask ourselves, am I teaching other people principles that I myself potentially am not hearing and in that way potentially missing the prize? In this room today we have people who do Bible studies, who teach on Thursday nights, Thursday night classes. We've got people who are parents teaching their children. And we all can ask ourselves today, am I busy teaching others and yet somehow missing the mark myself? Just like Paul says, he's very careful that it doesn't happen to him. When I read this verse, it was certainly, it certainly hit home, and I hope this verse hits home for all of us today. Then Paul goes into the, from chapter 10 from verse 1. He looks at the history of Israel and he uses those stories from the history to help us see that at least we're not the first people struggling with this. There's a lot of uh, stories from the Bible that shows us throughout history many people struggled with this dilemma of <coughs> why, why am I following Christ in the first place and why am I making the effort as an athlete to keep on running this race full out despite it being both difficult sometimes. Please read with me from uh, chapter 10 and verse 1. Paul says, For I do not want you to be ignorant of the fact, brothers, that our forefathers were all under the cloud and that they all passed through the sea. And of course he's referring to when the Israelites were led by a cloud in the desert and when they passed through the Red Sea. Now he's, he's building up an image here of the Israelites in the beginning when they left Egypt lived through a time where God performed many more miracles and had a lot more direct impact with the average guy. I mean, right throughout the Bible, there were you know, certain people who had a lot of contact with him and the prophets. But in those days, when they left Egypt, the normal man in the street, or in this case, in the desert, had a lot of evidence of God's power and might and miracles. And you've got to ask, if you're living in that time, surely, and you've got so much evidence around you of God's presence and, and might, Surely everybody in Israel must have been perfect Christians. Surely everybody must have responded to this daily evidence of God's power. I mean, imagine today here in Belleville, we saw all of this that they saw. You would expect a higher response rate. Let's read on. Verse 2. They were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea as they passed under the cloud and through the Red Sea. Verse 3. They all ate the same spiritual food and drank the same spiritual drink. <clears throat> for they drank from the spiritual rock that accompanied them, and that, that rock was Christ. Um, just as a uh, reminder, they were given manna in the desert. Every day this manna appeared, miraculously, and every day that's what they ate. If you want a daily reminder of God's direct uh, evidence that he supplies your needs, I mean, that must have been it. Every day you're hungry, and every day there's manna again, and every evening there's quail. And they're in a desert, and God supplies water, enough for them for uh, between one and two million people. There was enough water to drink. I think everybody in Cape Town will realize by now what a gift that is. Imagine the amount of water that had to come just to keep those people and all their animals um, nourished, and well, in this case, um, their thirst um, quenched every day in the desert. Verse 5. Nevertheless, God was not pleased with most of them. Their bodies were scattered over the desert. And the reference here is that <clears throat> of all the people who, who were in the desert at that time, we know that only Joshua and Caleb made it into the promised land. land. The rest died in the desert. And we're going to get to that story in a, in a bit. The key verse here is, nevertheless. God was not pleased with most of them. Their bodies were scattered over the desert. And one has to ask a difficult question of us today. You've got to ask in Belleville today, do we have many other advantages that, would, that one would say, since this is the case, surely most people would be the kind that God would be pleased with. Let's look at our circumstances we have the Bible at our disposal. It is inexpensive and available 24-7. We have each other. 
at our disposal. Anybody here knows that there are plenty of people in this room that if you are struggling spiritually, we can phone, go visit, can say, I've got a problem with this aspect, let's talk. There are excellent teachers in this congregation that go through a lot of effort every week to teach us things that you could have, you could have studied for yourself, but it does help to get another person's point of view. There are excellent Sunday school teachers in this um, congregation who make a lot of effort to teach our kids. Can you see how many of the positives are also in place, even though we're not witnessing the manna and seeing God's um, cloud over us, etc., etc.? There are many other things that God has put in place. Today we spoke about the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is constantly in us and constantly available when we, want, when we need the influence of the Holy Spirit. And to the extent that it is constantly available, we can tap into it. We know that. So you could ask modern-day church, since there is such an enormous amount of support from all sides, God, each other, the Word, the Holy Spirit, you name it, one would expect a certain level of intimacy with God. But I think we all know that that is often just not the case. And my aim today is that we ask ourselves, what is my, you, me, what is our driving force to have that intimacy with Christ that is available? Because remember, he keeps offering it. It's constantly available. What is the driving force to take hold of that and say, I will respond to what's on offer? Let's read from verse 6. It says, Now these things occurred as examples to keep us from setting our hearts on evil things as they did. The other day, <clears throat> I don't know what, we were reading stories after, after dinner, and Lisa and Emma were talking about the stories in the Bible, and um, they were asking me questions about the stories in the Bible, and I said, well, the stories in the Bible are there so we can learn what we should do. And then, obviously, one of the two kids perps up and say, yeah, but they also did a lot of wrong things. And so, in defense, I had to say, well, yeah, we learn about the wrong things so that we learn not to do what they did. You know, if, if somebody else, my mom always used to say, when, when the eldest kid did something wrong, and they said, yeah, but she did, then she'd say, yeah, you know? So, the lesson of the Bible is, is just because they did something wrong, we can learn from their mistakes, so that we don't do the same thing. And the next few verses give us a summary of many of the mistakes that the Israelites made so that we can learn from that and that we can see, well, clearly that kind of choice will not get us where we want to be. And we don't have to jump in the fire after them. Let's read verse 7. It says, Do not be idolaters, as some of them were. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink, and got up to indulge in pagan revelry. Now, for you guys, that's a wild party, okay? <clears throat> Idolaters, today we know, is, it doesn't seem as common because you don't go into somebody's house and there's a little um, image there on the side next to the TV. But there is a TV. And for many of us, entertainment has become the idol. It's become the thing, the object of our effort, that we have as much time available to be entertained for our enjoyment. Now, entertainment isn't wrong, but if that becomes our focus, you've got to ask, has it become our idol? And you have, um, I'm sure each one of you can think of other examples of things that, that becomes our idol, because if you come back down to it, an idol is something that is so important to you that you spend the kind of effort and money and time on it as if you are worshipping it. And each one of you can think of examples from our own lives. Next one. It says, verse 8, We should not commit sexual immorality as some of them did. In one day, 23,000 of them died. And we know that sexual immorality is one example of a very common sin today. There are many others. Paul chose to use this one as an example from Israel's history. In a, in a nutshell, sexual immorality and all other sins effectively pulls us away from God because it puts up a wall between us and God. And it makes our relationship and that trust we need to have in God, it makes it ineffectual. Because we know God hates sin, so we know that if we give in to sin, we are pulling away further and further from the God that has something else in mind for us. 
Then verse 9, we should not test the Lord, as some of them did, and were killed by snakes. Often the, the Israelites was really just like a naughty child testing God. And God had a lot of patience with them, and then at some point he said, enough is enough. Next verse, do not grumble, as some of them did. And they were killed by a destroying angel. And we're going to read in a moment about just the extent of that grumbling. Verse 11, these things happened to them as examples and were written down as warnings for us on whom the fulfillment of the ages has come. Verse 12, so if you think you are standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. And here I just see Paul's um, wisdom again. If, if strong Christians can... Um, like himself, can um, potentially fall. How much more can all of us fall? We are all weak sometimes. And we all need to be honest enough with ourselves and ask ourselves, is this applicable to me? If you think you are standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. Let us all realize that daily we walk by grace. Daily it is by God's grace that... When the temptation comes, he sends us the outcome, as we'll read shortly. Daily it is by God's grace that he makes us aware of the opportunities we have to have an influence in somebody else's life on a spiritual level. Next verse. No temptation has seized you except what is common to man, and God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will always, always also provide a way out so that you can stand under it. And that a way out is literally like an exit. In other words, it's not just a slight, uh, it's a complete emergency escape, like a fire escape. That is the, that's the picture he's painting here. God always provides us with a safe fire escape in the opposite direction so that when we are tempted, we can run away from it. Now... <clears throat> I want to go to the story in the Old Testament that Paul based this warning on for us. Please turn to me to, uh, num with me to Numbers chapter 14. I see our time is running out. I will just give you some of the highlights. <clears throat> Numbers chapter 14 from verse 1. Background is um, God promised them that they will take Canaan. They sent 12 spies into Canaan. Ten of the twelve don't trust God. And they come back with a report that, yes, Canaan is a fantastic place, but there's no way we're going to beat them. And only two people comes back and say, yes, we can do it, Joshua and Caleb, because only those two trusted God. And I must say, when I read this piece again, I was gobsmacked by <clears throat> the typical human behavior of the ones who do not trust God. Let's look at what they did. Uh, from this, chapter, Numbers 14 from verse 1. That night, all the people of the community raised their voices and wept aloud. Mass hysteria. They haven't even attacked yet, but they're all crying. All the Israelites grumbled against Moses and Aaron, and the whole assembly said to them, If only, this is also a nice common one, if only we did this, if only we did, did that, if only we had died in Egypt. Now that's a good idea. How's that better? If only we had died in Egypt. Or in this desert, why is the Lord bringing us to this land only to let us fall by the sword? So they already decided, there's no way. God promised them the land, but he doesn't know what he's talking about, and we are going to die. Our wives and children will be taken as plunder. Now, later on, you'll see how that specifically was one of the things that hurt God the most, that they didn't trust him enough to think that their wives and children will not be hurt in this war. God took it personally, for good reason, because he does love us, and he does expect us to love him back. He does expect us to trust him back. And out of all of this, the reason why Joshua and Caleb were different from the others were not because they were sinless. Of course Joshua and Caleb sinned. They were humans. But what comes out of the text is that they trusted God wholeheartedly, and they, that trust was based on their faith and their relationship with Christ. And that is today's message. Is that the reason we run this race, the reason we run this race together, 
is because of the trust we are able to have in God. And it is up to us to take hold of that potential trust that is always on offer. <clears throat> Verse 3, wouldn't it be better for us to go back to Egypt? Can you imagine them being in slavery for four, what, like 200 years at least? And them saying, no, this promise of God is not good enough. We want to go back to Egypt and rather go back to slavery. Isn't that what we often do as sinful human beings? God's release from sin is constantly on offer. And yet somehow, sometimes, we think our old lives was better and we run back to our old lives. I think we can all think of examples of that. Then verse 4, they say to each other, we should choose a leader and go back to Egypt. So it's not just that God's not good enough, we've got a better idea. God, I think you've had your chance now, but we will now make a plan because you can't help us. That was their way of thinking. Don't we often do that as well? We pray, but then we decide, well, I'll just have to make my own plans. And I'm not saying we shouldn't be proactive. I'm not saying we shouldn't use common sense. But our trust, in the end, uh, the, the core of our decision, the core of our trust has to be founded back onto God. And what the decisions we make shouldn't be opposite of what God would want us to do. Verse 5, Then Moses and Aaron fell face down in front of the whole Israelites gathered there. And I'm going to jump a couple of verses to verse 9. They say, Moses said, Only do not rebel against the Lord. Uh, and then jumping down to verse 11, the Lord said to Moses, how long will these people treat me with contempt? How long will they refuse to believe in me in spite of all the miraculous signs? Can you see how the conversation was mostly about their relationship with God, refusing to believe in him, refusing to trust in him? They did sinful things, but what, what um, God was focusing on is this lack of trust and this lack of belief in him. The sin obviously followed because of that lack of trust, but it began with trust and faith. Jumping down to verse 17, it says, Now may the Lord's strength be displaced, just as you've declared. Verse 18, The Lord is slow to anger, abounding in love, and forgiving sin and rebellion. Yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. And that, that message is the message that runs right through the Bible. Yes, he is slow to anger, and... We can thank God that that is the case. Yes, he abounds in love. Yes, he forgives sin. But he's also a fair God. And he expects us, when we are given fair warnings and, and a fair um, reprimand for the way we live, that we will respond. Verse 20, Then the Lord replied, I have forgiven them, as you asked. Nevertheless, as surely as I live, and as surely as the glory of the Lord fills the whole earth, not one of the men who saw my glory and the miraculous signs I performed in Egypt, will and then eventually go into the land of Canaan. And we know this is what happened. Because God said to them, yes, I will forgive all of you. I will not hold it against you in eternity. But there was an immediate consequence of their display of a lack of trust in God. Jumping down to the end of the chapter, we read that of the 12 spies, the 10 guys who didn't trust him and who spread these rumors amongst the people of how bad it's going to be, they died immediately. And only two, Joshua and Caleb, survived, and in the end survived right through their sojourn in the desert. <clears throat> to make matters worse, when they all realized, now we've really messed up, they decided again, we're going to take matters into our own hands, and they decided, we're still going to attack Canaan right now, today. Uh, yesterday we still thought they were going to beat us, but today we're now going to attack them, because we've realized our mistake. They went and attacked Canaan, and they were, um, it, it actually says it quite well. The last verse says, Then the Amalekites and the Canaanites who lived in the hill country came down and attacked them and beat them down all the way to Homa. Now you can just see this, running down the hill and beating them all the way to Homa. It's like they beat them to within an inch of their life kind of thing. Um, because God told them, do not go and attack them. I am against the idea. You've, you've rejected that I will help you to do it. So don't even try it on your own. I am against it. And yet they did, and they were beaten. Um, well, they, they would have died in a, in a battle such as this. To summarize today's lesson, we have from the Bible so many examples of God's interaction with mankind. 
A weary asks us, not what asks us, a weary expects of us to, to notice the many evidences that he gives us of his existence. Those evidences today abound if we want to, if we want to see them, if our eyes are open to it. This congregation and the church as a whole has many opportunities for us to make a difference, to be godly, to serve, to worship God in a way that he wants us to, to live the Christian life that he wants us to. Let us as a congregation and as individuals um, encourage each other as needed to live that life that God calls us to live because he makes it available for us every single day. Thank you.